<coughs> Jen, the students given the t-shirts are Anna, Anna Chatterjee and Stephen Lee from Race Car. Okay. Stephen? Stephen Lee, Anna Chatterjee. Yep, okay. <coughs> you two received your t-shirts, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> All right, I'm going to start admitting the students. Hey. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Beaverwork seminar series. <clears throat> um, please remember to put your name in attendance purposes. We're, we're watching everybody coming in now. Thank you for being here on time today. Um, we have a very exciting um, set of speakers for you today. So uh, today we have Malik and Miles George, who are both rising seniors at MIT. Um, they're undergrads studying biology, biological engineering with a minor in African and African diaspora studies. Um, they come from an African-American family growing up in New Jersey and attended New Jersey public schools. Um, and since joining MIT, they've become incredibly active in the MIT community. They're members of the New Delta fraternity. Um, they participate in a group called The Standard, as well as laureates and leaders, and they work with um, the admissions offices, admissions ambassadors, working to increase the number of uh, underrepresented minorities applying to and then attending MIT. Um, not to be outdone, they've also spent time working in um, biology labs, biotech labs, both uh, the Weiss Lab and Boyden Lab at MIT. Um, and they have uh, social media accounts um, focused on promoting STEM. So you might see them on TikTok, which is certainly a favorite in my house. So um, Malik and Miles, thank you so much for being here today. Um, the students, I'm sure, are very excited to hear everything you have to say. And students, remember, um, put your questions in the chat, and I'll call on you um, when the, the time comes to ask your questions. So thank you so much, and I'll turn it over to, to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much for uh, letting us be here. We know it's usually a rarity to see undergraduates uh, lead one of these beaver works. We see all these uh, great faces today. Um, we are tuning in live from St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, it's about 1130 for us. We're at Washington University right now doing genetics research. So a little different climate than our local Cambridge scene, but it's uh, good nonetheless. Um, so that's enough of the uh, embarrassing intro. You guys are here to see a presentation about how two MIT students run a TikTok page. So <laughs> let's get into it. Is that what we're signed up for? I, I think um, that seems about right. All right, everybody avert your eyes. All right, so welcome everyone to our presentation of, on TikToking about science the importance of science communication and diversity. Hosted by us, Malik and Miles. If you guys know about us already, thank you. If you don't know about us, uh, th that's us. Um, a little bit more about us, who we are. So as, as mentioned, we're from central New Jersey from a relatively suburban town. We got a fan in the chat. Thank you guys. <laughs> We went to public uh, schooling for most, not most, for all of our um, K-12 education culminating in uh, Woodbridge High School. We graduated co-valutorians uh, of our class. We participated in a class slash club known as Science Research. We did independent science project. And now after graduating, we are, ooh, this is. We just finished our junior year. Uh, so we're going to be rising senior. <gasps> Uh, this 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 whole time, man. Like we we entered as sophomores. Now we're about to be seniors. It's a, it's a whole yeah, blur. I'm time. sure I'm sure all of y'all have similar stories. Come out one year, come out two years later. It's 
it's insane. But, but yeah, we study biological engineering, uh, specializing in synthetic biology, which is all that fancy new uh, biogenetic tools. Uh, minoring in African diaspora studies, we like to locally call it black studies. Uh, uh, we are admission ambassadors, so you could catch us on the account trying to uh, stump some high schoolers. We don't necessarily tell them how to get into the school. We're just like, these are some type of questions that you don't need to know, but they're funny for us. <laughs> uh, and like Out, it, yeah, ahead. outside of school, we do STEM outreach. And you might ask, how do we do that? Well, first off, Malik and Miles on TikTok. Yes, that is the handle. We're approaching 60K quickly. You know, and if everyone here subscribes, we might be able to make it. It's not called a subscribe. It's not YouTube. There's a plus button on this. Y'all figure it out. Y'all smarter than us at this. And then we also do some public speaking, which we'll speak about later. We're speaking publicly right now. He's smart too. Move some images of just you know some some golden years in high school. You know, look, look at those uh, look at those tassels we have going on, as well as you know our account a couple a while ago, as well as an example of some of our uh, some of our videos. Moving forward, talk about our time at MIT and what we do on a more research side. MIT loves their research and we've definitely taken advantage of it while we've been here, uh, doing a couple of opportunities here and there. Our first one was actually our first year. A lot of people are just like, you can't get research your first year of college. Uh, you can. Um, we, did a pro we did a project known as iGEM, which is a synthetic biology competition. It stands for International Genetically Engineered Machine. Uh, and we worked on human immune cells and we tried to make a cellular swarm. We tried to make uh, native immune cells swarm a leader cell to try to like work on advanced cellular communication. And it and absolutely worked. No, it did not. It but did science not. usually doesn't. And you know what? It's a learning experience. Moving on from that one. Um, I work now in the Boyden lab, used to be in the media lab. It's actually affiliation is a little tricky, but more or less uh, it's uh, in the McGovern lab now. And I work on neurons, mammalian neurons, literally from mice. And I work on fluorescence and trying to optimize different uh, ways to visualize chemicals in the cell, mainly through plasma optimization. So I'm literally uh, online cutting and pasting different sequences into uh, an existing genetic piece and trying to see what works, what doesn't. And then because of uh, ixnay on the P word A, uh, I had to take on a more machine learning project where I'm trying to find a more automated way to analyze all of that data. Um, so I kind of have two pieces of that project. I've been in that lab for about two years now, and I'm going to be writing a thesis for it by the time I graduate. So. Oh, good luck to me on that. Writing a thesis. Speaking of writing a thesis, I now am back in the Weiss lab, uh, same place we did iGEM, but I work on biological modeling for the same word that shall not be said. I also uh, switched to a more computational based project where I now create a cellular simulations to both model uh, COVID-19 and other viral diseases, as well as some engineered cell uh, solutions to it through a lot of mathematical and computational modeling. And finally, Another recent project that we picked up is that we actually work with the um, with the Synthetic Biology Center in South Africa to help them study COVID-19, as well as how to apply synthetic biology. This research is actually pretty pressing as several months ago, there was hints that there might be COVID-19 variants developing in Africa and that may or may not have some uh, Current news applications. But we're not going to touch about that here. Just know that we saw it for <laughs> <laughs> Move it on. And then that involves some disease modeling that we could get our hands on. Maybe one day we'll get over to South Africa to do some hands-on research, but we'll see then. Oh, we already have questions. Check. No, I keep up with these. Do you have any tips for high, high school? Or do well, them as well? At the end. At but the end. Sophie, we are watching. Now on for the today's main topic, which is why is science communication important? First and foremost, it's cool. Don't you want to know about what other people are doing? Like there's two realms of, of like science, right? There's the people who do science 
and they so technical that they can't tell other people what they're doing. And then there's the public that wants to know what's going on, but don't know. And there has to be a bridge, right? Because if any of you guys have tried to read a scientific paper, it's very difficult, okay? I've been doing it for at least four years now. And it's still difficult. It takes me at least 30 minutes to get through an abstract. And that's to figure out the first sentence. And as someone in a lab and watching people write papers, I promise you, they make it like that on purpose. It won't get published. Now, when they present it to me, that's what you want to hear. But the it's written in a certain way, so it can't be understood, which I personally disagree with. Why is the font going to be so small? I don't know either. Okay, but anyway. ultimately, I mean, you all, uh, we can, yeah, let's just put so it on show, These are our, how we kind of, yeah, that's it. Here's our main reasons why science communication are important. First of all, STEM is meant to better the world, you know. Ultimately, we develop science, technologies, and engineering, and math. Not really develop math. But anyway, we discover and find these things out in order to help the planet, whether that's create some new medicine, develop a new technology, make people's lives easier. Ultimately, even though a small niche of scientists and engineers develop science, it is still supposed to impact the public. And in order for it to do that, they need to know that it's going on. You know, it's all good in, in the tiny lab meetings, but if it never escapes there, then did the tree really fall? You know what I'm saying? Uh, I think that's a metaphor. Um, going to our se second point here, like I said, there's creating and uh, then understanding the science and then there's explaining the science, okay? From a purely research side, you want to, you might spend your years, your life works creating something, but if no one understood, understands what that is, it's going to be very hard to, for people to understand how happy you are if you can't uh, convey it uh, properly. So a lot of work has to be done on that front. And then financially, because a lot of people don't often think about the finances of science, to get money from anyone, you need to be able to explain why what you're doing is important. And so explaining STEM, whether it's from a business uh, standpoint to family dinner, to a colleague in another lab who doesn't work with the model that you work with, um, Understanding STEM is very tricky and it's very much needed because of how niche it can get. In order to understand STEM, we kind of see that there's three barriers. One is level education. This one's most straightforward. You know, people who either went to school less than you did or for different things, just they aren't going to have the same jargon and background that you might think is obvious. You know, if mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell is not the minimum required, you're going to need to explain more things and take more time to explain certain concepts. Why are we talking? That's a different conversation. Next is time dedicated to learning. Once again, if you're in academia, you literally work in a university for a university and you are paid by the university. So you are all the time learning and you are supposed to. Other people who have jobs cannot spend time reading papers. And so once again, it's about... People have different focuses and you have to adjust to that. And the final one is logos, which is a fancy uh, English term for logic-based reasoning or factual arguments, which are people in STEM like to speak very logical, statistics, numbers. The graph shows this, it must be true. On average, people don't actually think like this. It's more emotional, it's more ethical, you know? And the best example I give of that is, can you think of a certain technology recently that a lot of people don't trust, even though we've been working on for over 20 years, it starts with a V and prevents COVID. But uh, ooh, so, uh, we got some, we got some bright people in the chat, you know. And that's just an example, you know. I could explain all day the, all how the vaccine works, but if people just have a bad vibe to it, they're not going to do it. And so bridging that gap will always be important. Uh, and so moving on to a second branch of science communication that, that just holistically brings us all in is also just uh, the point of diversity. Diversity is uh, probably one of the biggest buzzwords in the past two years, but it's always been a buzzword. I just, it shouldn't even be a buzzword. It should just be a part of the conversation. But diversity in STEM is very crucial, as I'm sure if any of you guys have done research in a lab, um, you know, you're probably in one of two, you're probably one of two spots 
for the majority labs, it's either majority uh, white and male, or uh, it's like there might be one or two underrepresented people in the lab, and they have very interesting experiences depending on who you ask. Um, and we, I bring those up to say that there's a rich history, uh, unfortunately, of underrepresentation and discrimination. And these can also only be solved by two more unfortunate buzzwords, inclusivity and equity. And breaking those down, inclusivity, of course, is making sure that you are allowing other groups to be allowed into these spaces. And then that differs from equity, which is when you're when they're in these spaces, are they getting the same opportunities and are they being treated the same way? You know, it's not just about letting them in, it's making sure that they're treated fairly. And once that is achieved, then you can say that your group is diverse. You know, being the only uh, black person in my lab currently, you know, it might not be diverse number wise, but I feel, I feel uh, treated the same, the same way, you know, I looked at as an equal, you know, and that's good steps. I've had many friends and so has Miles of stories of, you know, unfortunately that not being treated, the, not being treated the same or feeling othered in, in some ways. There was definitely a time in our lives where uh, it was one of our first ever science competitions and we were there as a part of our team and we were standing by our poster and we were definitely shooed away by some judge because uh, they thought we were in the wrong place and we were loitering. But two years later, when we won first place, he tried to shake my hand and I walked away because he didn't remember it. But that's a little personal victory. You know, don't, don't, sh don't be vengeful, you know, but it's about, but don't forget either. Oh, that's life's, life's funny sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's all I was, we'll put on that note. And in addition to the kind of moral reasoning about why you should want strive to be diverse there are two i would say kind of practical reasons in science as well on why diversity is important the first is development of ideas we are taught that science is truth right finding knowledge you know and it's not supposed to be biased however people are biased and the people that are driving the science are going to a choose what gets you know researched you know if for example a genetics uh, group, this is not adding anyone, I'm just saying if a genetics group is mostly of a certain, you know, background and they're gonna focus on diseases that historically affect that group. And so if, a, if uh, other ethnic groups are excluded then their diseases and medical issues aren't going to be uh, seen. And a, a cool example of this, it's not cool, but um, an example of this is how, you know, when you're, at the ho when you're at the hospital and they put the little thing on your finger to measure uh, your heartbeat, that's actually done through wavelengths of light. And recently people have figured out that if you have a darker skin tone, it is inaccurate because the wavelength of light reacts differently to the melanin in your skin. And that's an example of what happens when the science is developed by only a certain group of individuals. The same has been seen in like mach in machine learning, and like with facial recognition, there have been many things that have come out in the last couple of years where, where uh, black, Latino and other uh, darker skin tone groups have been harder to detect from facial recognition softwares, uh, other things in terms of trying to de, in, in attempt to make a machine learning algorithm uh, not biased for judicial law, They've ended, they ended up making a system that was almost more biased than the current system because all of the examples that they used to train the algorithm were based on biased cases from the past. So there's a whole there's a whole circle net of a reinforcing bias in technology that you need a diverse group of people so you can avoid uh, unforeseen problems such as those. And then going on with that, just when um, applying technology, the flow of ideas is not linear. There is not, unlike the scientific method might suggest, it is not an idea and you do that idea to the end and then you start over. There's an idea, it fails, someone brings up a, a new idea, you tweak it, someone brings up another idea, you keep tweaking it and then your final product might not be the same as the original product, but you have something. That 
collaboration and contribution is the strongest when you have people from many different backgrounds. They're, every person has a different walk of life than you do. And so everyone has something new to bring to the table. That's just not like from what you major. That's just from what you grew up in, the people you've been around, the experiences you've had. You need a wide group of people so you don't end up excluding uh, other peoples that you might not have seen could be affected and to avoid consequences that otherwise you might not have thought really would have been there. Um, and so with that, we are trying to find a way to tackle diversity and science communication while we're still in college. And so why not do that by clearly going to social media? Maybe we should go to school? Social media. Uh, our biggest uh, platform, we started this in January, is TikTok. We got trivia, we got trivia, we got memes, we got mini demos, we got presentations, and we got live streams. We will talk about uh, the state of the P word, the state of just something, some scientific article I read online, uh, some random fake science hack on TikTok that we see. Sometimes like just dance, to be honest. Yeah, that's fun too. But like, like a fact over the top of us, so it's irrelevant. See, you guys. You got to keep the mindset going. But ultimately, TikTok is a very fun platform because we get to engage with a wide variety of audiences of all ages and use trends in order to explain what are, by themselves, sometimes very difficult concepts. Outside from TikTok, we've picked up other social media platforms. Not as heavy, but to mainly do highlights and updates to our whole journey, we will do Instagram posts and uh Twitter, if we see some interesting science, I might retweet it there. Uh, some meme that someone made that made me giggle. Uh, we might promote different uh, science organizations and just even college-based programs that we might see that we're like, hey, you should do this, or um, this is coming up, you should do it. If there's any rising high school, hmm. if there's any rising high school juniors, uh, do a college summer program. Uh, they're listed on our website, which I'll get to in a second. I just want to put that out there. I want to I try to push that every single time. It's one of the reasons we are at MIT today. Um, and then besides that, we also have a huge uh, community server, which is over 200 strong now. And essentially, we have like we have postdocs in there, postgraduates, high schoolers, a couple middle schoolers who are just like, what's high school like? And then everyone else is just like, oh, you don't even know. And then they try to be hopeful. And then they're like, wait till you get to AP physics. And then someone's like, I don't want to do high school. And they're like, if only I, and then other people are just like, I wish I was still in high school. So it's a wide range of emotions and feelings that we have. We do direct educational stem advice. So if people have questions that we don't cover directly on our uh, social media or in talks, they can just send us a message and usually either we'll answer or someone else who knows will answer. Sometimes we'll do community events, we'll do Kahoot. Uh, anything like that. Uh -huh. now, um, by the way, I just want to make sure you're still paying attention. Uh, oh. okay. Three, two, Pop quiz. What is the boiling temperature of water? I'm waiting for the answer. Someone already had it pre-typed. All right, all right. Everyone who wrote, everyone who wrote it. Okay. So the question says Fahrenheit. Now, you know what? We'll take 100 C. Oh, 373 Kelvin trying to be special. Someone said 100 F. Someone said purple. But we're not going to talk about that one. Uh, <laughs> that's a little uh, run it, running uh, video. You know, it just keeps people awake. And, you know, it's good to always test what you learn just to make sure you're remembering it. Now, everyone who got it right will get a free high five from us whenever I see you. I don't have you guys memorized. But if you ever run it into one of us and you're like, hey, I said 212, you'll get a high five. Um, and so that's what we do on social media side. From that, I would say in February, we picked up another, uh, this, we'll have a Discord at the end of our presentation, but we also write the link. Uh, we also have started K-12 outreach. Um, literally, I was in a live stream and a teacher from New York reached out to us and there's like, oh my gosh, my fifth graders love your content. I was like, fifth graders? And then anyway, we reached out. And so what we do is for elementary school uh, and middle school students, we kind of just do a brief, uh, intro to STEM. We'll do a scientific demo usually and just try to explain why science is cool. You don't need to go in depth. It's just that 
one of the biggest things about STEM is literally exposure. There are communities that think that they can't become doctors or just do research because they it's never been exposed to them. So we're just trying to show that STEM is accessible to all groups. And so um, we presented to general high schools, we presented to uh, elementary schools and under in a, underdeveloped and underrepresented communities. We've presented to a wide group and throughout the school year, more and more people reach out. We try to reach out more. Uh, and like I said, in high school, we'll talk to a more upper level thing. So STEM careers, a roadmap to college, um, just our general undergrad experience and what does that look like? We give the actual tips on how to apply to college that your guidance counselors don't know, not blame your county guidance counselors, just that they have not been in the loop for a while. And there's a lot of nuances that it's hard to keep up with if you're not someone who's recently gone through the program and who actively keeps up with it. I mean, look at these pictures, look at the setup. You see the ring light, you see the second camera monitor, you see something that looks like slime on the left. You know, we got the signature lab coat so you know that it's us and we look official for the kids. Um, and so all of this has been what we have been trying to do to just make STEM accessible and friendly to a lot of people. We've had tons of feedback of people saying, oh my gosh, you're the reason I got an A on my biology quiz yesterday, <laughs> or um, I decided to major in computer science after seeing your STEM account. And it's uh, comments like those that really keep us going. Computer and, science? Did they even listen to any? I, listen, listen, it's STEM nonetheless. Um, and so we do what we can, uh, we do everything we can to try to promote. Uh, so speaking of promote, we're going to promote ourselves now. We want to thank you guys for listening. Thank you all very much. You know, Hit I hope you TikTok. Good. Hit the Instagram. The Twitter's the same as the Instagram. Don't send us an email unless you want us to perhaps speak at your school. If you'd like that, then, you know, hit us up on email. But once again, follow us here. Follow us on the Instagram. You know, uh, like a video. <laughs> oh, I don't know if the Discord link is working. I'll get you one in the chat. But listen, if you want QR doesn't work. Oh, no. Um, Give me two seconds. Uh, If you want us to come talk to your high school or you're just like go talk to my middle school they really need it or my little brother in, in uh elementary school and he wants to see a slime demo send us an email with uh, with your faculty better yet tell your principal these twins on tiktok from mit uh want to come speak to your school that might they might not take you seriously for once but you can send our website which has all of our social medias, which I am forgetting. Someone already was in our Discord and sent a link. You guys are amazing. I'm if you go a to million notifications, our so Discord is actually blowing up right now. But if you go to www.malikandmiles.com, it's very simple. Malikandmiles.com. Look at all look at all the adults. They're official. They got a .com. It's it's a very streamlined process. How many people are joining? Um, I don't know how much time we have left, but I just want to say thank you again for having us here. If there are any questions, um, well, I should ask how much time we have left in our segment. So you've got about about thirty minutes. We, we if you guys can stay till one thirty, we're we're good to one thirty. Excellent. I think then that means it's time for the question and answer portion of today's conversation. Fantastic. This is great. You guys are fantastic. Uh, we do, I'm stop and uh, I'm sure there are going to be more. Just time to look at the people, you know. My my moderators in my Discord are definitely panicking. <laughs> They're definitely panicking. This oh, <laughs> y'all be for, be friendly, be nice to them. But welcome, welcome all <laughs> to the to the family. So uh, maybe we can about. start with Kitty. Kitty had a question about um, getting involved in research in high school. Yeah, sure. Um, so first off, thank you so much for that engaging presentation. I'm a huge fan personally of your TikTok, and um, I'm also particularly interested in synthetic biology. So I just want to ask, how did the two of you get um, begin biology research, particularly with synthetic biology in the high school? And just what exactly led you to the field of synthetic biology, especially considering that it's still a growing industry and study? Um, well, I can start about, I guess, how we got into it. Um, so, like I said, and that goes into, I guess, an opportunity we had at our school, which was science research, which is, um, it's, we started as first years, we could have done it all the way to seniors, we stopped at our junior year, but it was actually a class where we got to develop 
our own independent research project. I think freshman year, we worked on zebrafish. So our sophomore year, we worked on fruit fruit walks. Those are like fruit flies, except they're, they genetically don't have wings, so they can't fly away. Very helpful. Um, and then our junior year, we worked with uh, Agwin mice and did a bit of an epigenetic study. But ultimately, we had that opportunity to do research. You know, if your school has something like that, great. If it if you don't, don't worry. I would say in ways of that is you can explore the field, honestly, whether it be you through YouTube videos, through reading papers, if you feel like it. You know, that's honestly how we came across that biology. It was, there was just a fun news article about we have made a bacteria that flash like a camera. And I'm just like, what does that even mean? Then I watched a bunch of videos and I realized that, hey, there's a cool field of science where people are engineering cells to do new things and it can solve a whole lot of problems. And I was just like, you know what? That's what I need to study. And then when I got into college, really, that's where I started exploring uh, the major more. You know, I saw that uh, one reason why I applied to the school is because they have a nice lab biology program. So for those of you, you know, thinking about, about that, you know, you want to look into schools for not just majors, but specific research interests, of course. And yeah, just uh, getting, uh, just having a personal interest and developing it in any uh, way you can. And also if you're that passionate about it, it also makes good for a nice maybe essay or interview topic to talk about your, that you're interested in a specific thing. Thank you so much. I'll definitely keep those tips in mind. Hey, Sophie, I think you were next. You had a couple questions. You can, um, you can ask whichever one you want. Okay, I was gonna ask something similar to what Kitty was asking, but I guess maybe if you could elaborate a little more about like how high schoolers can make an impact with research in high school. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Um, trying to remember. Uh, so like I said, so there's in school. I guess out of school, one thing that I know a lot of schools did at fairs is um, you can actually reach out to faculty. Um, at local universities, or even far ones, you know, your luck will be plus or minus. But for example, for our project, we actually reached, we read a paper about a, that was done at Emory University, and we thought it was interesting, and we actually uh, emailed said professor about their project, and they responded to us, and they're actually very, um, they were actually very helpful and helped us develop some ideas. I can't guarantee all experiences will be like that, but a, a golden tip to always carry with you, especially into college, if you want to ever cold email a faculty, read something they wrote and compliment it. They will answer. They, 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 they love to hear that someone read about their research. But so you can try to get involved in local universities, you know, and also just trying to see, you know, if you can develop a club, maybe even try to do that. And then ultimately, you can also do independent research projects, you know, outside of school. Uh, I know a lot of people who are in the computer sciences trying to make like computational portfolios, or even if you're in biology trying to want to begin with basic experimentation, you know, just going through the scientific method and getting your feet wet with seeing what the research process is like. That was really insightful. Uh, could I ask a follow up? <laughs> okay. So like, uh, so like when you apply to MIT, right, you can submit like a research portfolio. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips for people who are like already working in a lab and like, I don't know what a portfolio would look like. So just kind of wondering if you could elaborate on that. Uh, I can, I can speak on that. So we submitted one, right? Yeah. And so essentially um, for high school research and a portfolio, you know, like I said, no like college professor that looks at a portfolio is expecting you to like cure cancer or anything like that, you know, there is a methodology to conducting science and they want to kind of see that. So uh, the biggest things is uh, you don't necessarily need a story, but you want to do that basic outline. So you want an intro that goes over what you're studying and what you're doing. You want to go over any types of experiments that you ran and like what those are. You want to have those pretty proper, you know, just so people can like easily follow it. You want to, if, like I said, if you have data, try to make one or two figures and you know like you don't have to worry about the whole like nature level captions or descriptions just you know like here's my bar graph 
And, you know, you can write, if you don't want to write a caption, just write a paragraph of what it means, make some type of conclusion. And then I would say in a separate section, you want to put the more nitty gritty things. So like, but like you, you want to show you the commitment separately. So for example, how many hours a week did you spend doing the research? Uh, again, how long was it? So I worked on, I looked at plant cells from September to January, about four hours a week. Like, you know, they want, you can do, they want that, you know, if you can summarize your research again in like a sentence and just make that the mm -hmm. project description at the top, you want to do that. You want to like quickly uh, make it easy to see and summarize how much work you put into it. Um, and so those are kind of my biggest tips on if anyone's doing research already and they want to know how to summarize it. Thank you so much. That helped a lot. Excellent. Okay, so um, Akshata, I think you have a question about bias. Yeah, actually, I had a question uh, when you were speaking about like bias and like the workspace or just labs in general. I was wondering, like, when uh, biologists or like scientists they treat conditions that only apply to a certain range of people, is increasing diversity a challenge, especially with like the range of cases, the test cases being limited, and what steps are actually being taken to reduce bias in these cases? Um, we well, we know about different fields. Huh? Um. Probably the, that's something I was brought up. Uh, let's talk about the computer science field. Um, machine learning is the big buzzword where we're having all of these databases uh, train. We're, supposed to, we're trying to create unbiased programs by using these large databases. But the people who are picking databases and databases themselves also have bias. So one thing with that is in those things, sample size, you know, one of those basic science concepts, but it does have prominence, getting as much data as possible from a wide range of sources. Um, at my school, uh, not at my school, at Wash U, you know, there, there's a big genomics focus at this school. And uh, a lot of the, like the human genome project and similar projects are constantly being done here. And I think it's called the 100 Genomes Project, I believe. I, yeah. But either way, that whenever they do these very large sequencing projects, there's actually a lot of discussion talking about genetic diversity and like, and not like hand picking people, but like they actually are having conversations about uh, picking people from different regions. So you don't have, you know, oh, this allele uh, being a bit technical, but this gene is popular, but we picked everyone from Northern Europe. So that's just a, you know, a more ethnic, you know, trait, but there are, so sample size, that simple thing, but also just, just actively being aware of the possible biases that can arise from your research and trying to prevent them is honestly what I see most commonly. While in the past, such things weren't um, considered. Mm -hmm. Let's see what other- uh, Thank you so much. What are the questions we have here? Um, so Nan Nandana, you had a question about time management. Right. I just noticed that you guys do a lot of different things. So what tips would you have for time management? Oh my goodness. I learned time management way too late. The biggest thing, honestly, for me is Google Calendar. That's probably the biggest change I made in the last six months. Like just Google, like Google Calendar or whatever calendar you, you need something like the amount of, especially when we turn online, the amount of meetings you would have, like when you're in school, you know, physically getting up and going somewhere gives your like body a rhythm, but staying in bed all day and being like, do I have a Zoom lecture now? Do I have this presentation? Um, Google Calendar and just segment it. Uh, other things, figure out how you best work slash study. Like I am pretty much a group worker and group studier. That's I'm not necessarily individual, so I can kind of overlap a lot, a little more of my social, um, a little of my social, uh, I guess, need with like studying. And I, and I like um, sorted my schedule around that. Uh, so I would say that one of the biggest things for time management is just uh, figure out what is a priority to you at some point and just figure out when you like doing it and try to naturally fall into some groove like to figure to say that oh like to look at like a top five study tips like it might help but like everyone literally studies differently um and so like for example if you can't do homework before 7 p.m 
but you know you can work from 7 p.m. to 11 p.m. on homework and that's just what you're doing, then that's what you're doing and just do everything else accordingly. A note that I like to bring about time management. Now, some of y'all might know this. Many of y'all might think you do, but I'm going to tell you right now, you don't yet. Another, a very important part of time management is what you consider things that you manage. manage because in college, things such as eating, sleep, cleanliness, socialization, and mental health are some of the most important things that make up your life. And those also need to be factored. You know, you might, you might not write, eat food in a calendar, but the amount of times people will skip a meal to finish homework is numerous. So keep in mind that you will have lots to do and you want to, of course, do well in your academics and your careers and all of that, but keeping track of uh, personable things is, is very important uh, and keeping health in your management will, uh, will be very important to you as well. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Okay, um, Mindy had a question about how to break things down in a digestible way. Mindy, do you wanna ask your question? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and also thank you for that wonderful presentation. I know you guys talked a lot about STEM communication and how that's important. And my question was when explaining STEM concepts, how do you balance between a high level explanation versus a low level one. Ooh, let me start. Me and Malik are actually very good at this because uh, Malik usually uh, is much more detailed in explanations and I usually summarize first. So when we present together, it's usually pretty easy. But in general, um, I would say assuming high level is always safe and then add details. Uh, as needed by the audience. So for example, if you're presenting, if you're presenting some research you did to like your class, okay, assume no one knows your project except you, unless let's say you're in a biology class and you're studying DNA and you're doing a DNA based project, then maybe you can skip over what DNA is. But if you, but if you're not, explain everything. Like, uh, I'll give it a, I'll yeah, give it. yeah. We're about to present our uh, ten-week research uh, next week, and I was I was uh, talking with my mentors about hey, so this whole protocol that took six weeks to do, what part of it do like should I tell people? And I'm speaking to like other labs and lab mates, so everyone's pretty STEM oriented, uh, biology oriented. And he basically said, not really any of it. He was like, you need to explain why you're doing it, basic what you're doing. And then what comes out of it, but like the details of how many hours or like how much uh, water do I have to add to no one needs it. If, if basically you want to convey main ideas and you want your takeaways for explaining the science to be clear and whatever knowledge is required to do that is what I say is the minimum amount of, I guess, technical information that you need to say, but things such as statistics, jargon, you know, those can be tailored based on audience and if they don't add to main ideas. Sounds good, thank you so much. Okay, um, Maxwell, you had a question um, looking for some tips as you guys are finishing your projects. Um, yeah, because uh, for these projects, we, um, we have to sort of condense the uh, whatever literature that, that we've had to go through into a five minute video. So I was wondering if you had any tips on how to um, break that down into something that's easy to, I guess, um, digest. Okay, well, this is like, yeah, this is like how to do a journal club. Um, so it depends on the angle you're, you're um, presenting from. So like for as a researcher, the most important things I care about are like the abstract intro and the methodology. Um, but as someone who's just trying to like present data, I would almost skip methodology. You just, it's too technical. You don't even need most of the figures. You probably just need a uh, intro and honestly the discussion because the rest is kind of just a layout of the science. But if you're just trying to like understand it, if you read the intro, 
and the discussion and then reread the abstract, you should be able to restate the abstract in, at a higher level. This is something my professor brought up in a, in a meeting where we were talking about uh, writing papers and discussing papers. And he talked about it like this. If you read a research paper today, and then I ask you about three months from now uh, what the paper was about, you are going to be able to tell me about three sentences. And those are going to be the main ideas of that paper. And that is what you want to actually convey when you're talking about it. Because, you know, if you're, you're going to be like, oh, I read a paper about where they studied mitosis and then they uh, modified, they mutated a gene and saw how it changed or something like that. And that paper would have been 10 pages long and had a lot of experiments and things. But ultimately, uh, that was the main takeaway. And honestly, that's found in the abstract, intro, and discussion. Now, read the whole paper because you will need to do, need, then once again, depending on your audience, you might need to explain further. But in terms of what to begin with, it's what will, what did you remember when you read, when you read it? And what do you want other people who, you know, watch your video, you know, or see your presentation, what do you want them to remember from it? And those are the, the ideas you really hit on. Okay. Thank you so much. I'll keep that in mind while making the final video. Okay, Donning, you had a question about mentorship. Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was just wondering if you had any advice um, about the importance of mentorship or any tips about like getting mentors in high school, especially in research going forward into undergrad as well. Yeah, so I would say probably one of your biggest mentors is probably one of your teachers. That's probably the easiest and most worthwhile. Like I said, if there's any teacher that you had multiple semesters, that would probably be a good place to start. If not, uh, if you are STEM oriented, whatever teacher, like you had a very wholehearted STEM uh, experience. experience with. So like I said, let's say uh, you're, you took AP Chem and your Chem teacher um, and you're interested in just general STEM. If you talk to your AP Chem teacher, just ask like, you know, what college they went to, what did they work in something before going into teaching and just do that, you'll or start up a conversation. And then by talking to one teacher, they might tell you someone, another teacher in your school who's like, oh, this teacher actually studied, like let's say you wanna do biochemistry. It's like, oh, this teacher who might just teach intro bio actually majors in, uh, actually majored in biochemistry. So definitely opening up the conversation is a good way to start networking. But I would say in terms of the importance of mentors at a high school level, I wouldn't say you need like many, just maybe like one or two that are like pertain to kind of what you're interested in that can help guide you along the way or at least point you in the right direction. Definitely when you get to undergrad you and further, you start to get to specific mentors of all right, this person can help me with my major, this person can help me career-wise, uh, this person can help me with my social life. That's not a joke. Social mentors are nice. You know, people that can guide you around campus and like show you how to enjoy yourself and not do school, which once again, is an aspect of school, um, you know. But in terms of, um, but yeah, in terms of high school, definitely, you know, maybe one or two people that know kind of where you wanna go, it can kind of help you along that process. Got it, thank you. Um, okay, John Fredrickson, you had a question about STEM communication. Yeah, hello. So I was looking at the MIT curriculum requirements a little while ago and saw that there are some communication intensive courses that you have to take within your major. So that seemed pretty interesting to me and I was interested to hear what you thought of those. So I like the MIT curriculum. I have my clones, but for right now I'll say I like it. Um, there's actually two versions of communication intensive classes. So first off at MIT, uh, no matter what your major is, you have a set amount of STEM classes to take and a set number of humanities classes to take. And they're actually quite equal um, for the, at least the required ones. And so within your humanities classes, there are what are called communication intensive classes. And these are, it's gonna be a bit more writing, a bit more presentations, you know, and that one's gonna to be towards the humanities subject. But then, uh, and those you you have to complete by your first year and your second year, right? So now you're pretty, so that's to get you good at writing, essentially, writing and presenting in general. Next, assuming you're a STEM major, um, 
you will have what are, your, what are called your uh, communication intensive within the major, your CIMs. And that's your junior and senior year. And these classes are very interesting because they're also probably your major lab classes. So these classes are intensive as in, implied because you're learning a lot. You're probably running some kind of project or many projects. And then you're also going to be learning how to write formal lab reports, how to give presentations. And it's a good all-encompassing experience because it gives you this compact experience of what it would be like to actually do research, which is you have to, as we said in our presentation, you have to both create and explain what you're doing. All right, thank you. Okay, I think this is a really great question from Chan Zhao on stress yeah. Yeah, hi. So um, I just have a question about like, how could you manage your stress and keeping yourself from being like worn out and uh, like from having a mental breakdown in situations where you get stuck on your project or like uh, having like a lot of things coming at once? What I will say, and I have this, there's definitely a certain amount of stress that you have and some days will not, and some days you might just be bad to put it plainly, but um, it is, if you can like build up a mental like fortitude of like what you've done thus far and like what you haven't tried and like try to not get focused in the moment of like failure or like repetition, it can definitely like help a lot. Like also taking a step away from a research or a project, like, um, as much as we want results and you want like to get things done quickly, if you're just like, this is not working, but like take a personal day, like go, um, you know, go like instead of spending the weekend in lab, spend the weekend with your friends and restart next week, like literally skip the day. Like you're going to think you're behind, but you're going to give your mind time to refresh. And then probably on your break, you'll think of something to try the next time you work on it. So literally give yourself a break in all ways, shapes, or form. Like, and what I mean by break, like don't stop working on a project, go to, to go do homework in another class, go play a video game, go outside, like go eat, just do something else entirely. Um, and you will come back better. And ultimately another thing, just to always remember, especially if you're going into science and any kind of research kind of project, um, it, failure is a part of the process, you know, just, it has to be accepted and it doesn't mean you're wrong or you're doing something not fast enough. It's just, it's part of the process and looking at things from new angles and finding ways to do new, to look, yeah, look at new angles as well as to recognize that this is going to take time and, you know, I don't have all the answers right now, but I'm going to get there, you know, is a good way to kind of get through these mental blocks. Yeah. Uh, so considering the part where you said, like, when you noticing that failure is like a part of the process, but how, how could you keep faith in yourself and your ability when like you face a lot of failure and you start at like questioning, like, and is this really working? Is this the right way? And like, so um, how, how would you like keep your faith on like what you're doing? Um, that honestly comes with uh, practice and I'll say education and also mentors. Um, if you don't have as much of that, we're basically, you know, um, this is far along your careers, but it's unfortunately close to us. A graduate school is like this, where you're kind of in research limbo for many years. But ultimately, you have other people in your lab and you have your committee and they're going to basically say you're doing correct science or and then like this is where practice and education comes in, you know, scientific method or whatever methodology you have. If you have a set plan, you know, it's about learning how to bounce back from your failures, you know, being able to say, all right, this didn't work. But like, all right, these are the reasons why it might not have. Let me go change these aspects and then see what happens. You know, it's not about, you know, it's not about, now if you're doing the same failure repetitively, you know, then that's about practice and learning a technique of some kind. But if it's like, oh, I keep changing things and it's not working, you might just 
not be at the right formula, so to speak. You know, and that's just, once again, that's just going to take time ultimately. But just keep trying new things and you'll figure something out. Like that's pretty, pretty much how it works. Just keep trying new things and something eventually will click and you move in that direction. So, yeah. Thank you. That really helped. Okay. Um, um, go ahead. Sorry, right, really quick. I want to answer this because it, I don't think it needs it's necessarily its own full question. Aiden, uh, fine programs. Look right now. They should probably be opening up next month. They're weekend equivalents, more or less, of summer programs. Look up your favorite college. They probably have a fine program. They might be in person. They might be virtual. Not sure. They usually end of the end of September, end of October. Preview a school. You also get a fee waiver out of it if they accept you. So I would say that's the closest thing right now if you are a rising senior in high school. Also, for people worried about COVID lowering opportunity, remember, unfortunately, it affected everyone. And as working with admissions, we can say for sure, people are aware of uh, circumstances. If, and, you, you know, if you look up flying programs, you should find them. They're, they're all named different things, but like people have made lists online of them. We might have some listed on our website. I'm not sure if we started doing fly-ins, but yeah, most of the schools that have done uh, summer programs also have fly-in programs, which again are shorter and they're for seniors. Mm -hmm. That's great. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, Akshi, do you want to ask your question? So I just had a question on how do you get people like involved in STEM who maybe don't have a previous interest like in my own robotics club there's not a lot of women involved in like the actual hands-on building of the robot and um, how do you just make people involved without making them feel like they're forced into it and like kind of ruining that interest for them? Like uh, I would say introduction and exposure but don't angle it as STEM right like STEM is everything, like STEM is everything around us. Um, almost everything that someone can do can be attached to some way in STEM. And so figure out what someone's interests are and then just get them involved in the general idea of something that they like and then introduce how it has to do with STEM. Like for example, robotics sounds technical. It kind of does, but like, like for me, it was like, um, I, we had like, like Lego Mindstorm uh, when we were kids. And it was like uh, just the idea of um, just some of the different games you could do with it. And then from that, it was technically an introduction to coding because you had to like tell the pro like robot what to do. And so uh, start with just in like a, a very, very high level of like what you can do in STEM without kind of mentioning the technical words. And then once you see what they're interested in, like, like have them like kind of like follow a path of these are the types of things like, you know, someone might not like biology, but they like might have a love for animals. Right. Um, a lot of people like who like end up studying like marine biology are people who just loved like um, looking at like fish and stuff and things like that. So start from just the interest and then narrow down into uh, what STEM can provide within that interest of theirs. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much. We will save the chat and we'll send it to you so you can see the rest of the questions and comments um, that the, the students had. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask um, two of our race car students, um, Anna Chatterjee and Stephen Lee, if you could um, please unmute and thank our speakers. Yeah, um, on behalf of Race Card, I would like to thank Malika Miles for the amazing presentation. I think it was really refreshing to um, learn something today that's like non-technical, especially considering all the like advanced robots and like close science presentations that we had before. And I think you guys brought something up that's really valuable, especially um, in terms of like communication and STEM, because like in my opinion, ultimately the best teachers aren't people who are the most knowledgeable, but like people who are really good communicators. And I think you guys made a really good point about that. And yeah, again, I really enjoyed the presentation and I'm gonna hand it over to Anna. Yeah, thanks so much for coming and talking to us today. Uh, I have like, I agree so much with what he just said. Um, and it's, um, yeah, like, Properly conveying STEM is such an important topic. I mean, I've had the experience that kind of you discussed of trying to read 
particularly like biology research papers and just having to research like every other word you come across. It's definitely um, not always easy. So uh, yeah, it's a really important topic. Uh, and so we wanted to present you with a virtual BeaverWorks t-shirt. <laughs> Y'all make me cry. There's, I think this is actually, uh, it's actually so sad. This actually might be our first uh, memorabilia with an actual beaver on it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you guys. It means a lot. Wait, don't you have a brass rat? Hey, who told you about it? <laughs> <laughs> But like, but like, I can't. No one's going. No one's ever going to be that close to my finger. Like, look, look like, no one's going to be this close to, to my finger to see it. Like, this is actually <laughs> fantastic. Well, thank you guys very much, and good luck with all all of your um, plans finishing up on this year as seniors and all of your outreach activity. It's just fantastic. Thank you. Very thank, much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, like I said, any other questions? Put it in the Discord. Put it in TikTok. Whatever, we'll reach out, we'll get back to you. We'll start doing live streams again if y'all wanna join those. Uh, like I said, let's keep it uh, an active community. And like I said, tell your teachers to hire, to uh, <laughs> let us speak to y'all. <laughs> I'll definitely wanna hire you, like get my teachers to hire you. <laughs> Bye, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.